Well, good morning and um, welcome to, again to any visitors or anyone joining us this morning. Our world today seems like it's in a real mess, doesn't it? On the global front, war and disasters have caused chaos, unimaginable grief and displacement. We have seen many disasters this year causing chaos and grief. The recent PNG landslide is now reportedly at least perhaps 2,000 dead and many more displaced. The wars in the Middle East and Ukraine have caused the deaths of many innocent people and instability in our world. On our own doorstep, six innocent lives taken senselessly while shopping and the number of deaths from gender-based violence is an absolute travesty. I wonder if we've taken the time to reflect on these disasters. So often our own lives are just so busy and chaotic and, and, and we try to find ways to slow it down and we just sometimes can't. Amidst life, chaos and busyness, I know I love to have some peace and quiet although I get more now than I used to, that the kids have all left home. But I'm also an extrovert, so whilst I love time in solitude on my own, I find I don't need as much as I think I might. Today was what we were meant to talk about in, um, in this peace versus a world of chaos and fear, about solitude. But I, I've steered actually away from that and I'll tell you more why later. We also have a few fears, don't we? And we can see how anxiety and stress can become the norm. What is fear? The dictionary definition says it's a feeling of agitation and anxiety caused by a threat of danger. What frightens you? What gets your hair standing on edge? When do you become agitated? What are the things that you're afraid of? The National Institute for Mental Health has catalogued over 300 different phobias or fears and there's probably more than that now. And some of the top 10 on their list, and I'm not sure what order these are in, are a fear of public speaking. I know some people just, just cannot do it. A fear of death. A fear of flying. Fear of heights. And a fear of thunder and lightning. And then there's our Aussie wildlife, snakes, spiders and sharks, <laughs> the three S's. If you could be granted a time of peace and quiet, how would it look for you? Perhaps curling up with a good book and a coffee or in front of the fire, spending time listening to your favourite music, meditating, floating in the water, I love, I love that, just laying in the sunshine, enjoying all that nature has to offer. It may be a calm stillness that comes after the uproar and chaos and loudness of our children after they've left the school and we finally settle down. Or later at night <laughs> when they're finally in bed and we can feel like we've got, finally got some peace. Peace comes in those moments when we're in harmony with our surroundings and can rest. Or you might, might describe peace as an inner assurance or calm. And then as Aussies, we all know where real serenity can be found, don't we? Not too far from here, actually. <laughs> Amidst the chaos, the busyness, our fears and our difficulties, where do you find real serenity and peace? There's many differences between the world, what the world offers and what God offers. The peace which the world offers is often dependent on our surroundings, external props, or feelings, whereas God offers us true peace beyond what this world can give in whatever the circumstances of life. Yet so often peace is elusive. In the 3,100 years of recorded history, the world has been at peace for a total of 286 years. Over 8,000 peace treaties have been made and broken. And there have been 14,531 wars, accounting for the loss of 3,640,000,000 lives. And these figures, of course, they were a few years back. A lot more would have been added this year. Hands up if you love a good thunderstorm. 
Yeah? <laughs> Hands up if you hate thunderstorms. <laughs> yes, there's a few. <laughs> I love them. <laughs> this photo was taken over Winton Wetlands in 2022, showing the amazing, awesome power of its creator. I have a few in my family quite scared in a storm when one of my grandchildren stays. If it starts getting grey, all the windows are shut and the doors are closed and the <laughs> curtains drawn. <laughs> a few from uh, us from church used to go camping in Mount Beauty and um, in January. And as I said, I love thunderstorms, but I have to admit, not when sleeping in a tent. And we had some doozies up there, didn't we, guys? <laughs> Our reading today from Mark 4 sees Jesus and the disciples sailing from Capernaum across Lake Galilee to Kersey or Gesserinos, I think it is, after a full day of teaching. This journey was about six miles and would be six hours, but they had to contend with one of the many storms that can be easily whipped up on the Sea of Galilee. Here's the Sea of Galilee on a calm day and then in a storm. The disciples became afraid as the wind blew and the fury of the storm began to fill the boat with water. And these were seasoned fishermen. They were used to these storms. They'd experienced them. But for some reason, this one they felt was different and it was worse, the worst one they'd had. They used their skills, but they were still sinking. Then sometime in the storm, they, I don't know, we don't know when, but they suddenly thought about Jesus. It wasn't right at the start of the storm, Sometime later, at first probably being very stubborn as we know they were and proud, I'm sure they believed their experience and their expertise and their profession would have got them through it. But this, again, this storm was different. So where on earth was Jesus? Why wasn't he helping them? With the storm, he was raging. With the storm raging, he was asleep on a cushion. How could that be? You think he would have been wet from the waves and how could he not hear the thunder? He was totally at peace in the stern of the boat, sleeping on a pillow. Jesus had absolute confidence in the peace of God through this storm, even though it was raging all about them. The disciples didn't. They were afraid. They wondered if Jesus even cared for them as they frantically woke him up screaming, teacher, don't you care if we drown? They soon saw Jesus' care as he awoke and rebuked the wind and the waves, saying, peace, be still. The message says he told the wind and the sea to pipe down and the wind ran out of breath and the sea became smooth as glass. It again was peaceful. And then the disciples heard cutting through the air, why are you afraid? Have you no faith? Jesus had peace. He was not afraid because he had faith in the Father to protect and provide for him. He had faith because he was involved in the creation of the wind, the waves and the storms. And he longed for his disciples to have that same peace. He longs for us to know that peace. A peace that knows no matter what circumstances in life we may find ourselves. Our God is in control. He is in charge and he wants us to know that. The disciples were afraid because they could only see the storm. Their eyes were fixed on that storm. Last week we sang the beautiful eyes, turn your eyes upon Jesus. They had turned their eyes away. The storm was not the problem but where their attention was placed was. When our attention is so consumed by the storms of life, we often cannot see Christ, turn to him or trust him. And therefore, often peace, contentment eludes us and we're left with worry and despair. And maybe at times we feel like he's sleeping and not interested in our storms. In some of the storms that you've experienced in life, what questions have you asked? Questioning God is not a lack of trust. It is an expression of intimacy. God, are you sleeping? God, are you dead? Wake up and answer me. Don't you care? Why are you silent? Are you listening to me? God, where are you? 
and why is this happening to me? The cries of many faithful people within the place of worship in many of the Psalms. We hear these valid questions, again, as part of the worship. All perfectly valid questions and undergirding feelings that are actually longing for an intimacy with God and a desire to want him close. I know many of you have been through huge storms and I've admired your perseverance and the amazing testimonies that have been born out of loss, out of chaos, out of fear, out of confusion and tragedy. I heard one of, I heard Rose yesterday share hers at a, a ladies luncheon over in Bendigo. Powerful. Your faith only needs to be as big as a mustard seed to hang in there. And I know that at times prayer have not been, prayers have not been answered in the way you would have hoped. God can heal. There is no doubt about that. Praise him. But he doesn't always. And that's no reflection of our faith or the words that we pray or how we pray them. For me in prayer, I'll ask very specifically, but I believe the Holy Spirit always leads me in the end in my wrestling to God, whatever happens, I'm just going to let you be God. In other words, God, you know what I want, but I will trust you to have your way. But that doesn't happen instantly. Amidst life's hard stuff, do you know God's peace? When have you been given it and how has it changed you and your circumstances? I googled images for peace. I often Google it when I'm doing my sermons, pictures, (laughs) as you can tell. and, And so I googled images for peace and the fruit of the spirit. I scrolled through loads of pictures, beautiful sunsets, calm waters, luscious fruit, of course white doves and even a cute puppy. All beautiful images all probably evoking a sense of peace. But peace is very easy to have when life is going well, when we're feeling good and our emotions are in check. We all need to get away for solitude at times and it is so important. But it is easy to find peace sometimes in the solitude. But as I thought more about it and sat with God, he asked me, when have you really felt my peace? And I have known, and I know you have known, God's gift of peace in life's hard stuff. In fact, any aspect of the fruit of the spirit is like this. How do we know if we love when everything in us wants us to hate? How do we know if we have patience when our patience is being tried? And how do we know if we have the fruit of self-control when we just want to explode? For it is never our fruit It is the Holy Spirit's, the fruit of the Spirit, not the fruit of the saints. We cannot produce the fruit. We bear it when we remain on and in the vine. An artist was commissioned by a wealthy man to paint something that would depict depict peace. After a great deal of thought, the artist painted a beautiful country scene. The artist gave the picture to the man, but there was a look of disappointment on his face. The man said to the artist, This isn't a picture of true peace. It's not right. Go back and try again. So the artist went back to his studio. He thought for several hours about peace, then went to his canvas and began to to paint again. When he was finished, there on the canvas was a beautiful picture, serene picture of a mother holding a baby in her arms, smiling lovingly at the child. We all feel... (laughs) You know, they all, that tugs at, well, tugs at my emotions anyway. He thought, surely this is true peace. And he hurried to give the picture to the wealthy man. But again, the wealthy man refused the painting and asked him to try again. The artist returned again to his studio. He was discouraged. He was tired. He was disappointed. He was annoyed. And he, he thought, he even prayed for inspiration to paint a picture of true peace. Then all of a sudden, an idea came. He rushed to the canvas and began to paint as he had never painted before. When he finished, he hurried off to the wealthy man. He gave the painting to the man and the man studied it carefully for several minutes. 
The artist held his breath as he waited for the response. And the wealthy man said, now this is a picture of true peace. He accepted the painting, paid the artist and everyone was satisfied. And what was this picture of true peace? The picture showed a stormy sea pounding against a cliff. The artist had captured the fury of the wind as it whipped up the black rain clouds, which were laced with streaks of lightning. The sea was roaring in turmoil, waves were churning, the dark sky filled with the power of a furious thunderstorm. And in the middle of the picture, and it's not particularly clear, under a cliff, the artist had painted a small bird, safe and dry in her nest, snuggled safely in the rocks. The bird was a peace amidst the storm raging about her. Peace is a prominent theme in the Bible. In fact, the word peace itself is found in 400 verses in the Old Testament. And that does not count the synonyms of peace and the allusions to it in all various shades of meanings and usage. We find the term peace in 26 of the 27 New Testament books. 1 John 1 is the only one that doesn't have it. Our John 14, 27 reading says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give it to you as the world gives. It's a little ironic that one of the best descriptions of biblical peace was given by Jesus the night before he was to be arrested and face death on the cross. He knew what was coming next. He knew what he would face. Yet he took the time to comfort his disciples and us today by offering us the gift of peace. The Greek word for leave doesn't mean to leave something behind in this context. It actually means to hand it over. Christ hands over his peace whilst knowing he was about to experience the worst form of torture and death and even worse, that his beloved father was going to desert him. Here Jesus models to us that perfect peace. In the storm on Lake Galilee, he wasn't freaking out like the disciples. He was at peace. When the religious leaders were being contentious with him, he didn't lose his cool. He maintained control. He was at peace. And when he was being betrayed and arrested, at peace. Being falsely accused, at peace. When he was being stripped and beaten and nailed to the cross, he was at peace. And as he was dying, he offered a convicted criminal that same gift of peace. Do you know this peace that God gives? Is Jesus in your boat? When have you experienced it? For me, one of the most tangible times I felt God's peace was at St Vincent's Hospital, and some of you may have heard this, sorry, (laughs) after my husband Dave had just had an operation to remove as much of the malignant tumour as possible. This tumour was in an inaccessible area, so they would never get it all. But you always live in hope. On the day of the operation, I had some very dear friends with me. Oh, sorry. (laughs) Had some very dear friends with me. It was about a six-hour operation. At around 3.15, they rang me to say, the, the medical team rang to say that he was out of the operation And, of course, they hadn't got it all. It was then I realised nothing had changed. It was then I realised the tumour was still terminal and I was devastated, but that was seemingly our last hope. I went down to the chapel on my own for some time. I didn't think I was ever going to be able to leave it. I couldn't bear to face Dave and the kids knowing where the next part of this journey was going to lead. After some time, my friends came down and prayed for a while. Or should I... And we, we, we prayed for a while, but I didn't. They, they prayed. <laughs> I just couldn't. And all of a sudden, as they were praying, this incredible sense of peace landed on me. It went right through me. It surrounded me. It was concrete. And it was so tangible and so real. I was dumbfounded. When I asked them if they could feel it, they couldn't. I couldn't believe it. I've never felt so incredibly at peace in all my life and I've never felt it again in quite that way. It was like being cloaked in something else. It was a gift. It was the peace that the world could never give. 
but my God could and he knew when I needed it. And he gave it to me for the next part of this difficult journey that I could face the kids, I could face Dave. And I know that if it hadn't been given, we couldn't have got on with life in the way that we did as we prepared for death. If that peace hasn't been experienced or if worry or fear or anxiety had set in, it would have robbed us of so much precious time together in those final days. Fear, worry, problems, grief, the state of the wor world, soured relationships often rob us of the peace which is ours, which God gives. Jesus stated that the peace he offers is a gift. We can't earn it, we can't use it, we can't manifest it. Our willpower will never find it. We can only ask for it. It is a gift, but as with any gift, it's useless if it is not opened. Peace like grace is a gift, but it's not an anaesthetic. It doesn't mean no pain or hardship or difficulty. It means peace within all circumstances. The peace that God assures you and me is not a peace deficient of difficulty. What he promises is to be with us in the midst of our mess, in our struggle, on our gloomy days, and speak peace into our spirit, even while everything around us is unravelling and becoming disconnected. It's a peace that comes in the knowledge that our sins are exonerated and forgiven, that Jesus Christ is our saviour and our redeemer. It's a peace that comes from an awareness that our name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Pastor Paul Scheidt says in his book, Preaching Helps, God calls us to faith, but so often we prefer to hope for miracles. From Fresh, Fresh Faith by Jim Simbala, what do you think it would take to amaze Jesus, he asks. Was there anything that impressed him to say, wow, that's really something? Never was Jesus astounded by anybody's righteousness, wisdom or education but he was amazed by people's faith. Almost every time that Jesus healed someone, he said, your faith has healed you. In faith, as we call out amidst our fears, the chaos, the injustice, God speaks in the storm. His voice is loud and clear. I am with you always. As Job found out, as the disciples found out, the only answer to our questions about life comes with a simple but powerful answer. I am with you, period. And I will never leave you or forsake you. The peace Jesus gives enables us to be calm in fearful circumstances. Not easy. I'm not pretending that's easy. But it is a peace that is never affected by circumstance. It surpasses comprehension, undistracted fearlessness and unwavering trust. It's not fleshy or earthly, it's real, it's spiritual, it's holy and it's confident. Jesus entered the world as a baby when it was in turmoil. He still offers to enter the worlds of people who are in turmoil today and give them a peace which the world cannot ever give. Receive, accept, unwrap and use this gift for it costs God his glory, his status and his life. From 2 Thessalonians 3.16. May the Lord himself, who is our source of peace, give you peace at all times and in every way. May he bless you and be with you now and in the coming days. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for your gift of peace. Lord, many of us have, have come to know it in the, in the hardest places in our lives. But we thank you that you do give it to us in, at those times, that you remind us that you are with us. We know that we cannot get through those times without your peace. Help us to hold on to it, to search for it, to long for it, to rest in it, and to know it in a very real and tangible way amidst the hard stuff that life brings. Lord, for those this morning who are struggling, God, I pray you will minister to them through your Holy Spirit. 
and give them your gift of peace. I pray that they may draw alongside someone later if they need to, to to, um, pray and to be reassured with someone else that God is amidst whatever they might be going through. He knows your pain. He sits with you in the mess. And we thank you, Lord, that you do that, that that is your promise to us. May we claim that and may we sit with you in that stuff that we find so hard to deal with. Give us a peace in this chaotic world amidst our fears and our pain and our suffering. In Jesus' name, amen.